All right, continuing on with the brain, we're always going to keep the big picture in mind. Always put everything you're learning here in context of the flow of information, afferent, sensory, and efferent motor. And here we're going to introduce you to the most advanced integration center, the cerebral cortex. When you think about the brain, you're probably thinking of the cerebrum, which takes up the majority of the brain mass and covers the diencephalon and brainstem like a mushroom cap. In contrast to the smooth appearance of the medulla, pons, and midbrain, the outer surface of the adult brain has these major folds and grooves. The growth of the cerebrum during human embryonic development is extreme compared to other animals. The five brain regions begin uh, roughly the similar sizes during the beginning of early brain development, but notice the growth of the telencephalon region explodes relative to the other regions. And you'll see this trend in cerebral expansion when comparing mammals to lizards, when comparing primates to mammals, and when comparing humans to any other primates. Indeed, there's nothing particularly special about human brain cell types, nothing unique about the neurotransmitters, and all vertebrate brains have a pretty similar organization. So a slice of brain tissue under the microscope looks pretty much the same whether it's a rat, a sheep, a monkey, or a human. The difference is this major expansion and surface area of the cerebrum which is going to translate into pure processing power. Like all of the central nervous system, there are two distinct tissue areas, the gray and white matter. And on the spinal cord and brainstem and in the deep areas of the cerebrum, there are clusters of gray matter surrounded by white matter. The cerebral cortex, however, there's a superficial region of gray matter covering the entire surface of the brain with the white matter lying deep to it. The cerebellum, mind you, has a similar organization. So let's go over this white matter first. When you see white matter in the central nervous system, remember you're looking at is large collections of myelinated axon called tracts. So when we see white matter, we're talking about these large tracts carrying information from one place to another. Whatever message is being sent has already been processed and created, and now it's just being delivered. Kind of like cabling, like your optic fiber cables, bringing your Netflix content to your house. So there's these three major types of white matter tracks of the cerebrum, and these are defined as what parts of your brain are talking to which parts of the brain or the rest of the nervous system. Commissural fibers, and the main example here is the corpus callosum, allows the two left and right hemispheres to communicate with each other. Now there are some important functional differences between the left and right, but for the most part they are doing the same things for different sides of the body. More on that later. But for a seamless integration of sensory and motor processing, the two hemispheres are constantly talking to each other. A second of the three types of tracts are called association fibers, and these fibers are carrying information from one brain region to the next brain region within the same hemisphere. As we'll see, these brain regions are highly specialized in carrying out very specific functions, but they're also deeply connected to other specialized regions by these association fibers. This will allow complex, higher-order processing of information. Last, projection fibers are those connections between higher and lower brain centers, axons bringing information from lower brain regions and the spinal cord for higher-order processing. Then decisions and commands are sent down projection fibers from the higher orders to lower areas to execute those commands. So all these white matter tracks are just passing on signals from different areas of the central nervous system. That so-called information is going to be generated in the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. So remember the brain is all internons, just talking to each other. The white matter corresponds to the axons of the internons, whereas the gray matter corresponds to the cell bodies, dendrites, and unmyelinated axons. And this is where all the high-level processing is going on before being sent through those cables. So the word cortex means covering, and the cerebral cortex refers to this thin layer of neurons that surrounds the entire cerebrum. This is why the basal ganglia and a few other structures are referred to as subcortical nuclei. So the cerebral cortex is the seat of the highest level processing and integration, leading to, among other things, consciousness. So when you hear things about areas of the brain being responsible for things like memory, planning, face recognition, understanding speech, generating speech, hoping, worrying about the coronavirus, dreaming. This is all happening in the cortex. So the major gross anatomical difference in the cerebrum versus lower brain areas like the brainstem is not only in size, 
but in the folds and grooves on the surface of the brain. The shallow grooves on the surface are called sulci. Between the sulci, the twisted ridges of brain tissue are called gyri. A deep sulcus is called a fissure. There's some landmark fissures, sulci, and gyri in your lab activities you should be able to identify. So the rationale for the sulci and the gyri, the folds, are the same reason we see dermal papillae and microvilli, and that is it allows a great increase in surface area within the same space. The massive expansion of the cerebrum during development requires these folds in order to keep your head a reasonable size, which might otherwise be the size of a large beach ball to accommodate a human brain. Indeed, about two-thirds of your neocortex is within these sulci and gyri. Compared to a smooth mouse brain scaled to the overall dim same dimensions, we would still have vastly more amounts of neocortex for enhanced computing power. So what's the human brain doing with all that processing power? From a gross anatomy perspective, there's no clue about the functions of any particular region of the brain, or the brain at all. It pretty much looks the same all over. A characteristic wrinkled external experience and an internal gray matter covering the white matter. And historically, functional regions have been found by people who have had serious brain damage and later by neurosurgeons sticking probes and electrodes into different regions of the brain and seeing what happens. Nowadays, information about functional brain regions can be inferred by seeing different regions of the brain with more activity when doing particular tasks. I should tell you that these kind of studies should be taken with a grain of salt for various reasons that I won't go into, but you could ask me about them if you're interested. But overall, we do have a pretty good base of knowledge about the functional areas of the brain. And this will be the next topic, but I'll end with a broad generalization of the dividing the brain into an anterior and a posterior region. That is to say, the frontal lobe, that area anterior to the central sulcus, is more associated with motor function and high-level planning, whereas the posterior section, that is the parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes, are involved in making sense and meaning out of sensory information. This is not a scheme typically stressed in most textbooks, but I find it a useful concept for beginning to understand the functional regionalization of the brain. And that will be the next topic. See you next time.